Many Christians uh, today, unfortunately, believe that if you live the right kind of life, if you never miss you know, devotions or a church service, it's going to create this spiritual force field around you that's going to keep bad things from ever entering your life. One best-selling author says that if you get up in the morning and make positive declarations, God's going to give you nothing but good things. He even writes this, use my book as your guide for declaring your victory each day. In other words, he says, get up in the morning and declare health, declare favor, declare abundance, declare it, he says, and it will be yours. There's an ancient Hebrew word that comes to mind when I read that and is pronounced baloney. <laughs> this teaching is nothing but false teaching. We call it today prosperity theology. Personally, I like to call it lottery theology. In other words, you know, go, go get the right ticket, make sure you got the right number, and God will make your life and every area of your life easier, healthier, wealthier. Well, the Bible actually teaches something far different than that. Jesus Christ never defined a good life in terms of your doctor's report or how much furniture you have or how many cars you own. Have you ever thought about the fact that a godly life doesn't even save you from trials? Now, according to the Bible, a godly life prepares you for trials. The Apostle Peter wrote, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, 1 Peter 4.12. See, Peter's description of a fiery trial in the furnace of life, well, I can't help but wonder if he had something in mind, an event that occurred centuries earlier, back in the Old Testament, recorded for us here now in Daniel chapter 3. Now, you might remember that Daniel interpreted the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar back in chapter 2, and in that uh, dream, the empires of the world were pictured for us uh, in the image of a man, and the head of gold represented Nebuchadnezzar. It represented the Babylonian Empire. Well, now here in chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar builds an enormous image, 90 feet tall, to represent this dream. Only he's changed something. He's made not just the head, but the entire image of gold. You see, Nebuchadnezzar is announcing my kingdom is going to last forever. It's never going to be defeated. Now, more than likely, this image is additionally meant to honor the Babylonian god, Nabu, for whom Nebuchadnezzar was named. Archaeologists have discovered on the plain southeast of ancient Babylon a brick mound 45 feet long and 20 feet high. They believe it apparently served as a, as a base, a foundation for, for something large, a large, a, a tall structure. Many believe uh, this was actually the pedestal for Nebuchadnezzar's image. Of course, the image, the gold, has long since disappeared, but the ruins of the pedestal are still there. Now, keep in mind that this event here in chapter 3 takes place some 20 years after Daniel and his friends had arrived. So, uh, they've been officials in the empire for nearly two decades when this image is built. Daniel is evidently absent, more than likely traveling on some assignment from the king in the empire, because this chapter now focuses on the faithful testimony of his three friends. Daniel never appears. All the important people in the kingdom, the governors, the advisors, the military leaders, all the VIPs, they're all now invited to the dedication ceremony of this image. And after everyone arrives, the king's herald steps forward and gives these instructions. Verse 5 tells us here, 
When you hear the music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. So this isn't just an act of loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar, by the way. This is a religious act. So the music starts. Everybody bows down to the ground except three men in their early 30s, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And let me tell you, now is the time, if there was ever going to be a time for you know them to whisper to each other, hey, what harm could it do if we bowed down? Besides, you know, everybody's doing it, but they refuse. The news quickly reaches the king here in verse 12. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, verse 13 tells us that this throws Nebuchadnezzar into a rage, a fit of violent anger. Evidently, he's as hot as the furnace nearby. And he calls these three young men forward and asks them here in verse 14, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, with that, Nebuchadnezzar offers them a second chance. Maybe they didn't hear the instructions clearly enough. But he makes sure they hear the warning this time. There, there is certain death in that furnace over there if they refuse to bow down. He says here in verse 15, Who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Their reply uh, to the king is a powerful statement of faith. I love this. Verse 17, Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image. Listen, beloved, this is one of the most remarkable statements of faith in all the Bible. They say to the king, listen, our God is able to deliver us out of your hand, But if not, whoa, wait a second, back up. Did I read that right? Our God is able to deliver us out of your hand. You're supposed to stop with that, according to prosperity theology. God is going to deliver us, period. We're going to declare that. That's going to sell books. Declare your destiny with positive thoughts. Don't give room for doubt, or don't give God room to not deliver you. Listen, beloved, they knew God could deliver them from the fire, but they didn't know if God would. This isn't doubt. This is one of the deepest statements of faith you can make. God can do it, but it's up to the will of God. You see, you don't speak your destiny. You surrender your destiny to the Lord as you trust him with your life. Well, with that, Nebuchadnezzar is so angry. Verse 19 tells us that he orders the furnace to be heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Now, this was a smelting furnace. That's a large structure with a lid up on the top through which materials would be dropped. There was a ramp usually made of earth leading up to the top of this furnace, a large opening, a door down below on the ground level where these materials would be removed. Well, up that ramp walk these three young men. They're not trying to run away and they don't have to be, you know, forced. They walk up that ramp and now they're thrown into the furnace like logs on a fire. But instead of seeing three men writhe in pain and then die, the king now sees them walking around with a fourth man, whom he describes here in verse 25 as looking like a son of the gods. This is a Christophany, what theologians call a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ in a physical form. Uh, so these, these four men are, are in there, and they're having a wonderful conversation. One author said they're, they're walking around in here like they're in a palace instead of a furnace. So the king, he, he, he's mystified, of course, shocked with everyone else with him. So he hollers out here in verse 26, 
Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Now, it strikes me that Abednego could have said, well, we're not going to come out until we're finished talking to Jesus. Or, we're not coming out until you apologize. We're not going to come out until you give us a raise and promise us a new chariot. (laughs) Oh, no, none of that. They aren't interested, beloved, in being vindicated. They are interested in God being glorified. Nebuchadnezzar now makes this public declaration here in verse 28, which would have pleased these three young men tremendously. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Would you keep in mind, beloved, that God does not eliminate the fire. He just joins them in it. And frankly, he does the same thing for you and me today. He doesn't eliminate the trials you experience in the furnace of life. In fact, sometimes he allows that furnace to be heated seven times hotter than normal. God doesn't remove us from all trouble, but we can trust his presence in the midst of trouble. And listen, he assures us that in the middle of that fiery furnace, whatever it might be, well, we happen to be in the middle of the will of God. Well, until our next Wisdom Journey, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.